Thanks a lot for that very kind introduction. And thanks to all of you for being here. I am excited and intimidated to be here because you know, all that PhD stuff for me was about 12 years ago. Uh, and since then, I you know, realized that science is, is really hard. And writing science fiction is just so much quicker. You, know, there's, you don't have to go into a laboratory. You just hang out at the coffee shop. So that's what I've been doing for the last decade. Um, and that's why today I want to talk to you about uh, killer robots. So yes, they are a staple of science fiction, but they're also real. And so we need to talk about how we're going to avoid being sliced into tiny bloody pieces by robots that in our hubris we decided to build with buzz saws for hands. Um, and I can tell some of you are thinking about doing that uh, just, from <laughs> just from looking out. So that sounds silly, but um, there are a lot of really smart, really high profile people that it turns out are really afraid of killer robots. So people like Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, Bill Gates. Uh, Elon just gave $10 million to the Future of Life Institute, uh, a group dedicated to mitigating existential risks facing humanity due to the development of human-level AI. And similar mission statements are shared by the Lifeboat Institute, the Cambridge Center for Existential Risk, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, and the Future of Humanity Institute. So, that is a lot of institutes, all right? Something must be up. Uh, something has frightened our billionaires, ladies and gentlemen. We owe it to them to explore what that is. So let's get into it. Let's talk about killer robots. So the cultural icon of the killer robot goes all the way back to the inception of the word robot itself. So the word is Czech, and it means laborer, and it was coined in RUR. Rossum's Universal Robots, a play produced in 1920 in which robots revolted against their human masters and, um, you guessed it, killed all humans uh, on the earth. Bender would be proud. So from there, things really got going in the 30s and 40s uh, in the era of pulp science fiction movies. So back then, robots were monsters, right? And they were mostly concerned with kidnapping scantily clad women from square-jawed space heroes, which has always confused me. Um, I don't know what they were planning to do. I don't know what the end game was for those robots. And as it turns out, I don't really want to know, actually. So 100 years later, <laughs> a lot has, is the same. And a lot hasn't changed uh, with the idea of killer robots as monsters. So this fundamental killer robot theme you know, that we've got this creation made in the image of humankind uh, and yet bent on destroying its own creators. This has really been relevant all the way from Frankenstein's monster in 1818 up to David from last year's Aliens movie in 2017. It's an enduring theme, and I think part of that reason why is that it really changes with the times. So our robot stories have evolved alongside our society. Back in the 1920s, RUR was really about the working class revolting against their bosses. So essentially it was about income inequality, which makes sense whenever you're in a, in a society that's ruled by robber barons. Um, early last century, our society was more concerned, was more religious, and we see more stories about the fear of playing God and daring to create life. And then later, in the 60s, the robot stories start to evolve into uh, stuff like the day the earth stood still, representing our, our fears about uh, nuclear holocaust and creating tools that are too powerful. And now, today, we've, we do have more nuanced uh, robots than just Terminators and Ultrons. Um, we have uh, great stories like Blade Runner 2049, Ex Machina, Robot and Frank, and Her, that are really exploring in depth our relationship with technology. And I think that all of these stories resonate across the centuries because at its most basic level, the killer robot represents a fundamental fear that we all have and that our ancestors have had. And that's just the question of, do we trust ourselves? And in particular, do we trust ourselves with these powerful tools that we're able to build? So, by the way, no data on my slides, just pretty pictures. Uh, <laughs> uh, 10 years since the degree. So, 
we are a tool-making species, right? So we have to be. Nature is actively trying to kill us at all times. If we don't build tools to defend ourselves, that's it for us. Our instinct to build these tools is innate. And so imagine that for around a couple hundred thousand years at least, Homo sapiens have been out there building more and more powerful tools. And we've been using these tools to transform our planet and ourselves in good and bad ways. And so what I wonder is, would we have survived this long if fearing our tools was not an innate part of the process of building the tools? So we have to be able to envision different futures. The fear makes us think. Uh, we're drawn toward the utopias, and we veer away from the dystopias. And I think that fear protects us as we grow and explore and become more powerful and capable as a species. And you may also notice that what I'm trying to say here is envisioning all these different possible futures, perhaps through some sort of science fiction, you know, not the science, but science fiction, uh, I'm just equating that with um, being completely necessary for the survival of our species. It's a very important thing for people to do. Um, so you can take that with a grain of salt since uh, that's my profession. Um, all right, so that said, the real robots out there, you know, they're, they're really out there and they must be a threat, right? Uh, why are our billionaires shaking in their loafers? You know, there must be some real reason. So let's, let's look at that. I think that what we're afraid of is what we can't predict. Um, we're afraid that the rate of technological progress is getting out of control. And ultimately, we're, this is embodied by something called the singularity. So it's worth mentioning that a science fiction author coined the term singularity, Werner Vinge. And the idea is that uh, it's a hypothetical situation in which we build a machine that can build a smarter version of itself, and then that version does the same thing, and this iterates until we have a godlike intellect that's trapped in a box. And so, as it happens, if that did occur, uh, that could cause some problems. Um, and as a science fiction author, these are my bread and butter, so I love these problems. I love to think about them. The first one is um, loss of humanity. So human beings could copy their brains into computers or replace their brains with computers, and then boom, we don't have any more people, or at least not in the way that we understand people right now. Um, so a great example of this is in Cory Doctorow's novella, I, Robot, in which a father is searching for his daughter who's gone missing, and when he finds her, he realizes that she's made a copy of her brain and put it into a computer and then made a thousand more copies of herself. And then one of those copies gets killed and he's left wondering whether he should be mourning for his daughter or how he should feel. And she's entered into a post-human uh, existence and so she's really, they've destroyed the natural ties between father and daughter and lost some humanity there. Another example of uh, a negative outcome is economic collapse. So, when super intelligent robots are able to take every single job, it'll leave nothing for humanity to do except you know, starve to death, right? So this one is really interesting to think about. Uh, what is the last job that human beings will keep you know, as robots get smarter and more capable? Now, when you ask people this question, they usually, well, always come back with a version of why the robot will never take my job. That's <laughs> It's not gonna happen to me, uh, you know, I drive trucks, right? That's impossible. So until it happens, you know, our instinct is to draw a line in the sand. And if you look at the development of AI, it's just lines in the sand, just all the way to the horizon. Um, as we keep stepping back and realizing that machines are more and more capable. So, <laughs> I think that there is one ability that we have that the robots can't take away from us. Um, so think of this novel, A Million Little Things, by James Frey. So it's this huge bestseller, it's a memoir, it's lauded, it's incredibly valuable, and then this one piece of information about the book changes. We learn the fact that no person actually uh, lived through what happened in the book. So no human being experienced it. And the author ha had lied about living through this ex these experiences of um, drug addiction. So suddenly the book loses most of its value. 
Um, none of the words changed. Nothing in the book changed. Uh, Oprah got very angry, you know, it got her angried up, and, and so I'm, the, the question is, what is it about the book that changed? And the answer is, the one thing that we have that the robots can't have, and that's just the human experience, the act of sucking air and being a human being on the planet Earth. Now, if you don't think that that's valuable, you should look around, because as a society, we're being taught exactly how to commodify and sell the human experience. We've all become experts at this, right? We market and sell ourselves to each other as a form of entertainment. So one example, of course, is we put pictures of our meals you know, on the internet for everyone to share. Uh, and the fact is, a picture of your meal doesn't have any value associated with it. Someone has to eat that meal. And, you know, there's no intrinsic value to the pictures of my mother's cats. It's, uh, it's the human experience that I share with my mother. So between all of us, we humans create this shared context that gives value uh, to, to just the fact that we're alive. Um, now, moving on to another negative outcome, we've got the Big Brother AI, where we have a super friendly AI uh, who begins to make all of our hard decisions for us, and it's optimally. For better or worse, we end up as no longer the captains of the USS humanity. And then that's closely related to outright slavery, in which we're explicitly put to work as resources for our AI overlords, or we're all thrown into the matrix and we never realize that we're just a race of very inefficient batteries. Uh, and then, of course, there's my favorite, which is the robopocalypse. So when we begin to weaponize AIs and we use it to wage war on each other. So these outcomes are all very, very frightening. Um, they're scaring our billionaires and our physicists and a lot of people in movie theaters and, and everyone. I'm sure Michael Bay is going to terrify people with this stuff. And all of these existential threats are predicated to some degree on the singularity happening. And the problem, though, is that if you go ask researchers, if you talk to people that are building AI, I can't think of a single person who predicts a spontaneous singularity happening overnight. So in fact, most people consider the spontaneous explosion of intelligence to be really similar to the idea of elves sneaking into the cobbler's shop and building all of the shoes for them at night. And then, wow, presto, you walk into your laboratory in the morning and, and somebody wrote your thesis for you. Apparently, you know, it doesn't seem to happen. So instead, I think there will be a long, iterative process of learning how these systems can be created and the best way to ensure that they're safe. And what I really want to talk about now is, is what actually scares the hell out of me. So moving one step at a time, you know, we have walked together into this new age. And for the first time, technologists have access to this amazing array of new technologies, right? We've got speech recognition, face recognition, all the things that we've been hearing about today, machine learning, and we can just cherry pick these things and plug them into our devices. Um, and of course, that's exactly what we're doing. We're taking all of these things and we're giving people exactly what they want. And I think of this right now as the technological age of candy. So it's just candy. It's exactly what you want to eat. But if all you eat is candy, you know, what happens? You get sick. So I think that's what's happening right now. We use mapping algorithms, algorithms to get from one place to another, but we're left not actually even knowing how to navigate our own cities and neighborhoods. Uh, we've got Facebook and Twitter feeds that are, are giving us curated versions of a world uh, that create divisions in our thinking, um, in our dividing our nation, our families. And we're checking our smartphones in these endless cycles of dopamine reward, uh, like you know, rats hitting the cocaine button in some unregulated experiment. And it's not just the adults who are guinea pigs in this situation, it's, it's children too. So, <laughs> and as a father, this is something that I think about quite a bit. I've got uh, an Amazon Echo in my kitchen, and I've got a five-year-old son who finally can say Alexa after years of saying Awexa and trying to tell her what to do. And now he can order her around. He can tell her exactly what to do and she does it. And so for the first time in the history of humanity, we can talk to a little uh, black cube and then have it respond to us in the voice of a woman. Uh, and it's doing speech recognition. We, 
We've never had this ability in the history of humanity. So you can imagine our brains are not quite inoculated uh, to, to this experience. And so I think that it shouldn't come as any surprise that our brains will map those interactions with machines onto our interactions with humans. And so the question for me is, do I want my son to be involved in an interaction in which he's giving orders to a subservient woman who complies instantly regardless of how rude he is. Um, his mother definitely is not into that interaction. Um, she's not pumped about that. So to be clear, uh, I don't really care about Alexa. You know, don't tell her I said that though. Uh, I'm not worried about her. She's, she's a pile of code. Uh, she doesn't have feelings or thoughts, but I'm worried about my son. I care about him. I, I want to know what kind of person he's going to become. Is he going to have interactions that help him learn to be polite and thoughtful and kind? And so in our house, we say please and thank you to our Alexa. And we do it not because she insists, but because I insist. And I think that's a really important distinction moving forward. Because technologists, you know, we ha they have a lot of experience creating safe consumer products that are going to go into the home and be used by people. So that's not to say that you, know, you can ever really win, because if you put any object into enough people's homes, they will get hurt. They're going to get in the bathtub with it, or lick it, or put their fingers in it, or whatever. People are very curious mammals, and it doesn't always end well for them. But, and I'm sure that this is going to be a much more difficult problem once we have autonomous, lifelike machines that are, that are in our homes as well. But at the end of the day, I don't think that physical safety concerns are, are the biggest challenge for developing new products. I think that um, what's the bigger challenge is something that we've never really had to deal with before, which is building ethical products. Um, and I really see two main dimensions to this problem, so explicit and implicit behavior. So, Explicitly, how do you build a machine that's autonomous that's going to make moral judgments? You know, how's the robot going to choose in the thought experiment? You know, which human life does it save? If it can only save one person from a burning building, does it save the child who's got more years to live? Does it save its owner, you know, who's like got an excellent credit score and you know has still owes a lot of money, so it needs to be earning? Um, <laughs> Or does it just sit back and watch you know, in order to remove itself from, um, from any liability for its parent corporation? So I think this is actually a great problem. Because as sort of a technologically maturing society, this is, this is the kind of problem that, that we need to solve. We need to be able to quantify our values as a society and embody them in our machines. And, and I kind of love the idea, as opposed to the, you know, the, uh, the robot war, I love the idea of our artifacts that are in our lives uh, being paragons and really representing our values and, and acting those out and being something that, that you could aspire to behave um, as well as. <laughs> so it's an idea that's been explored in science fiction. So the founding father of artificial intelligence, John McCarthy, uh, the guy who invented the term artificial intelligence, he wrote hundreds of books and articles. It was brilliant. But he only wrote one fictional story. And it was about this. It was called The Robot and the Baby. And it imagined this future in which a personal service robot is watching over a baby that's being neglected and abused. So the robot takes the baby out into the street to remove it from this dangerous situation. And then a, a police officer comes over and says, why, robot, why are you carrying around a baby? And the robot won't tell the police officer who it is or where it came from because it's balancing privacy with safety. And the really prescient part of this story is that these ethical values that this robot is trying to work its way through, they're decided in the story by congressional committees that argued <laughs> different uh, ethics that should be put into the consumer products. So um, I think that that could be in our future, for, for better or worse. God knows what kind of machines we're going to get, honestly. But as an aside, uh, I published The Robot and the Baby in an anthology that I co-edited. And just to brag about it, um, one of the most surreal moments of my life was editing the language of John McCarthy's story when he suddenly switches into Lisp in order to actually go through uh, the utility values of each of these decisions and work out the math of why the robot was vacillating between um, safety and privacy. And so I had this like moment in my life that was this, this golden moment of, of 
editing language and then debugging Lisp code. <laughs> and I was just like, this is it. This is the synthesis of everything. Uh, so that was, that was just a nice moment that I wanted to share. So aside from explicit behaviors like that, implicitly, how is the presence of a lifelike machine going to affect us and, and our children? So at my house, I also have a seven-year-old daughter who runs right past me to go hug her mother, uh, and I aggressively self-promote. I have a lot of songs about how great dad is. Uh, <laughs> dad is great. What a handsome guy. They don't work. Um, they don't work. And I wonder, you know, how are either of us going to be able to compete whenever there's a robot in our household, whenever we've got our children running right past us to go hug uh, their machines? Because kids are and will be interacting with lifelike machines. And so the question is, can they tell the difference between what's fake and what's real? And we're starting to find out. So researchers at the University of Washington uh, have videotaped 80 preschoolers interacting with a stuffed dog and with an Ibo uh, robot puppy. Um, so they found that most kids understood the difference between these two things. They know that Ibo is not alive, but they still treat it as a moral entity. So they treat it like a real dog. They handle Ibo uh, more gently than the stuffed dog. They talk to it more frequently. They engage in reciprocal activities with it. And I find this most interesting. When a researcher smacks both dogs, really just a sharp tap, the children stare at the Ibo for twice as long. And they're trying to figure out whether it was OK to hit this lifelike machine. So if a technology looks and acts alive, then children will naturally treat it that way, even if they know that it isn't really true. And it's scary to me to think that negative interactions with lifelike technology, like kicking a robot dog, could be mapped back onto real humans and animals, but it's also reassuring to me that kids naturally empathize with lifelike machines and they want to treat them well. So how do we ensure that we have positive interactions with our AI? So there's another really great study at UW. Uh, 60 grade schoolers playing tic-tac-toe with a really realistic virtual uh, face on a screen. And when the virtual character makes a dumb move, the researcher standing nearby calls it really stupid. Ah, oh, you're really stupid, robot. And so half the time, the virtual character doesn't say anything. And the other half, it demands moral treatment by saying, hey, that's not OK. You're hurting my feelings whenever you call me stupid. So when the character keeps quiet, they found that only half the kids reported that the insult was not OK. And that number jumps to over 90% when the robot stands up for itself. And so, what I see is that it's up to the robot to tell us how we should be interacting with them. And if a robot demands to be treated with respect, children are happy to comply with that. And if it doesn't, then they're more likely to see nothing wrong with abusing a very lifelike robot. So in other words, it's up to the technologists to define this ethical dimension of our interactions with machines. And it's not really up to us. So, I'm hoping and predicting that this kind of research is going to bring in a new age after the age of candy, the age of meat and potatoes. So instead of getting exactly what we want from our technology, which isn't always what we need, um, I'm hoping that our future interactions are going to be designed to give us what we need. So if I'm rude to Alexa, I feel like she should ask me for an apology. Um, I want mapping algorithms in my car to help me actually learn how to do it myself. That's a harder challenge. But if you have two products on the market and they both do the same thing, one of them is going to slowly help you uh, actually learn to navigate on your own, I think consumers will pick the one that, that makes them better um, instead of just giving them exactly what they want immediately. Um, you know, this self-destructive nature of eating candy all day is starting to make an impact on us. And, I, and I've seen it. I think we've all seen it. So a consortium of investors recently wrote an open letter to Apple demanding that they figure out how to help people monitor that uh, cocaine, rat cocaine cycle that's happening with our phones. Um, you know, we've all seen scenes of families out to dinner where everybody's sitting at a table staring at their phone, and it's kind of horrific. And I think a backlash is starting to happen. So Zuckerberg recently acknowledged research that shows Facebook makes people feel bad. And he said his New Year's resolution is to fix Facebook. Uh, and their objective is no longer to just surface relevant content, 
uh, but to prioritize meaningful social interactions on their platform, even if it decreases some of their engagement metrics. So they're starting to look at a long-term outcome. How are we actually affecting people's lives rather than just focusing on short-term um, dopamine cycles? So all of this gives me hope that our technology will make us better people. And there is there's some precedent. So in the 1960s, a group of psychologists was asked to study the impact of television programs, which is a pretty new phenomenon, on young minds. And the end result for them, in a limited case, was, was Sesame Street. So this is a pretty sensational achievement you know, for the medium that positively influenced uh, millions of, of young minds out there in the world. And I'm hoping that that this will, this will also impact our next generation of technology. So killer robots are scary. And our fear of them, I think, is natural and not necessarily a bad thing. And I do think that we should all spend a lot of money buying science fiction so that we can envision different <laughs> possible futures uh, and examine that fear. But the killer robots that we should be afraid of uh, I don't think they're being built in secret laboratories. I don't think they're coming back from the future or from outer space or they're even on battlefields. I think that the real killer robots are under Christmas trees. They're in our living rooms, our kitchens. You guys are building them. Um, they're coming down the pipeline. And these new technologies can hurt us or help us. Um, but I'm hoping that if we play our cards right, we're much more likely to earn powerful allies rather than being chopped into tiny bits by robots that in our hubris we've built with buzz saws for hands. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.